Luke, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I've yeah. got a bit of a funny question for you first up. Uh, what's, sure. the, what's the funniest uh, name of a Wi-Fi that you've ever seen? Ooh, nothing that I can say on the internet, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, trying to think of one that's YouTube appropriate. I don't know. Um, I mean, I always make my Wi-Fi names like very obscure jokes. So uh, I, I, I don't know. Nothing I can say on YouTube. I'll just say that. Um, Nice. The best one I've ever seen is, uh, well, maybe not the funniest one, but I actually call my Wi-Fi that, my hotspot, and it's called Trojan.exe, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, I've seen a lot of FBI surveillance vans, stuff like that, you know, just, just cute little things. But, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the thing, when I was in college, we would change our Wi-Fi to just, like, crazy things just to see how other people in our dorms would react in, you know, I don't know. Well, anyway, so that's another story. But... So let's jump into the real stuff. So globalism, elitism, take us back to the time of inception, take us back to the beginning. So where does it all um, begin? Well, you know, I'm a big fan. Now, a lot of people in Monero, of course, understandably, they're, they're kind of libertarian leaning people. And so there's a tendency to look back at the early days of the Enlightenment as a time of like genuine progress, right? Um, but, you know, freedom is, you know, a lot of personal and individual freedoms, you know, this is when you really hear people start talking about this kind of stuff like personal autonomy. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of like a poison pill. And I think the appropriate way to look at it is like, especially after Newton, right? So when you think of Newton, um, you know, he, he had this grand synthesis of like science where um, all of the, the matter moving on earth and the movement of the stars, they're all related in the law of gravity. And how a lot of people started looking at humankind in the enlightenment is well humans can be like that too like they if, if humans humans are driven by impulses they're ra you know rational economic agents um they have sexual impulses they have certain desires and how a lot of people th this is really it's not just the beginning of liberalism but kind of the next step is well if people can be free to follow their own devices we can also predict how they're going to act and we can also get in front of that like we can engineer them in different ways you know um so you know one, one of the um one of the specific ideologies that are originated at this time period was of course you know utilitarianism this idea that uh and it sounds great on paper right i mean it's almost like a truism like um you know society should be arranged in such a way that it causes the greatest good for the greatest number of people right i mean that who doesn't agree with that um but that really created this uh, this mindset where intellectuals began asking questions that they never asked before. Like before people would say, how does society work? They started uh, you know, asking these questions like, well, how can we design society? How should it work? Like, how can we control human behavior? And so, you know, the irony, you know, Jeremy Bentham, who's one of the biggest utilitarians, on one hand, he was, you know, all for personal freedom, you know, libertarians even look back at him as being a positive figure. Well, at the same time, he also created famously the the uh, idea of the panopticon, right? So this is like this prison that where the warden is in the middle and no one can see who he's looking at and he can see everyone in the prison. Uh, and it was this great social scheme to uh, run not just prisons, but, uh, you know, schools and other kind of things. So um, I, I think this is when this first starts. Like on one hand, you know, there's the, the, you know, people have a positive view of, oh, well, we have more freedom in the times of the Enlightenment. But the first thing that intellectuals start doing is start saying, well, how, how can we use this to our own benefit? You know, how, what, what is the society that we want to have? What, what does that actually look like? So that I say is the beginning and the rest is kind of, uh, it, it's history. Like in, in the modern term, you know, people on the internet nowadays, you'll hear people talking about, you know, Klaus Schwab and all these mean people. Um, but even in the early, earlier uh, 20th century, right, one of the big names was, you know, B.F. Skinner, um, who was a behaviorist. And behaviorists, it was an overwhelming majority of people who did psychological research. And the entire idea there, uh, uh, Skinner actually wrote a book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity, where his whole, whole idea is bending the human will through conditioning. Um, not, not just to force people to do something. This isn't author authoritarianism. This is something even more pernicious. It's like controlling people's soul by, you know, more or less 
uh, incentivizing them to do what you want, right? So this is a, it, this is kind of the beginning, and this is how ultimately you know elites nowadays look at us when they write their books. They look at a, you know our specific des desires as being something that has to be fixed and replaced with something that they want. So you know that that's what I would say to give a long answer to that question. So when does that start? So you mentioned all these people. Like roughly, when was that? Uh, I mean, this is like your 16, 1700s, maybe, maybe a little bit before. I mean, you can you can debate who is like the first figure to do this, but it's really just a change in mindset that people had. Um, you know, as I said, like in so if you study economics, one of the first things you learn is that you know you can do descriptive economics where you describe things that are happening in the world. Or you could do normative economics where you say what should be the way things are, right? That's something you, you learn in Econ 101. It's a distinction. And allegedly, we're only supposed to do, you know, positive or descriptive economics. We're just supposed to describe things. But this, this is a big intellectual change where people stop thinking in positive or in, uh, you know, descriptive terms. And they start ta talking about, well, how can we design society? And this is something we totally take for granted, right? Because you go to a school, you go to an elementary school, and every elementary school student gets this, you know, get pro gets prompts in their assignments where they're asked, well, how would you design the world? If you were king of the world, what would you do? These kind of questions, right? Um, and before, I, I guess, the late Middle Ages and on, like, people didn't really think like this. When you look at, I don't know, let's say Stoic philosophers, they weren't necessarily interested in this utopian social engineering. They were more thinking about how can the individual cope with the world as it is? How, how can he interact with it? Um, and so the end result, you know, obviously is, uh, you know, when, when you're a social engineer and this is whatever kind of philosophy you have, doesn't matter if it's utilitarianism or Marxism or whatever, um, eventually you're going to run into a asynchrony, like a, a disjunct between your theory and how people actually work. And the, the weird thing about modernity is that we have a tendency to say, well, actually, it's if, if those two are in disagreement, it's the people who are wrong, right? Um, and this is, you know, obviously where we get to things like transhumanism and this whole idea of remaking the, the entire essence of mankind, which is, I don't know, kind of what we're slowly moving to, you know, starting with behavioral engineering, going further on to that, so... So just spitballing, how much do you think this has to do, especially obviously <clears throat> in Europe, how much do you think this has to do with the uh, houses of nobility and um, yeah, kings, queens, etc.? cetera? Um, well, it depends on what you mean by that. I think if anything, you know, king, monarchy, if you want to say, um, represents, I, I, guess, I guess, an antiquated mode of political systems at this point because... You know, a monarchy has its political power vested in few people, um, and ultimately it's something hereditary or passed down from one person to another. And the human attention, you know, the attention span of a monarch is only so wide, so it's it's less likely for him to do these kind of engineering schemes. But, you know, as, as we are in America right now, we, of course, don't just have a monarchy. Or, well, it's not that we have a monarchy. We have a very distributed power system. And that sounds like a good thing, like checks and balances. Um, but that also means that our political system has so much momentum behind it because there's no, it's not just like a bad king is going to die, right? You have this entire academic system, this political system, uh, and a, a, a kind of self-perpetuating system that um, is all kind of on the same page ideologically and working to a common goal. Um, it's not necessarily put in paper. It's not like an active conspiracy. It's more like a conspiracy, a decentralized conspiracy of ideology and, and worldview. Um, and th because this is how people look at the world, this engineering mindset, it encourages lots of technologies that ultimately use people as pawns, right? Um, so if, if the only sense in which I would say that it's related to monarchy and, and houses of royalty is that... Um, really the countervailing and well this is true of the enlightenment of course like because the enlightenment not only is about you know personal freedom quote unquote um it was also very much about getting rid of these countervailing traditional powers by virtue of them being irrational so monarchs uh, we got to get rid of them religion we got to get rid of that and what you have left is ultimately just a man following his own felt desires right um um what, and that again makes makes people a little bit more predictable and that is more conducive for social engineering. So where did it all go wrong then? Obviously like thousands of years ago, we had Stoicism, we had a lot of ancient Greek philosophy. Somewhere along the line, 
this has died out in society, right? So today, there's there are some people who know about stoicism and uh, think deeply about life, but by and large, most people don't. You know, most people go to work, uh, they come home, they they fear food, they watch their fear TV shows, and they are generally speaking supporters of things like utilitarianism, for example. So, where do you think the knowledge has been lost along the track and gone from a place of individual freedom to a place of let's call it utilitarianism, where they just think that their opinion should be enforced on everybody? Um, I don't think there's, uh, there are probably multiple things you could say, oh, this is the one moment things that went wrong, the thing where things went wrong. Uh, but I really think it's more of, uh, I mean, it's an appeal in ideology, frankly. Um, the idea, like elevating yourself above other people, you know, saying that you have the right to tell others, uh, you know, you have this specific knowledge that makes you fit to plan how society works. I mean, when I when I was in economics uh, as a academic discipline, um, this is very. I mean, you you have this idea that oh, all the world should be economists, right? We should be making, we should pl be plotting all this kind of stuff out, and that you really do start to look at people. I mean, again, uh, Skinner who wrote this book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, uh, it's a very good example because on paper. I mean, beyond freedom and dignity, it sounds bad, but in Skinner's idea is that people do have freedom. They are going to have freedom in the system, and they're doing exactly what they want. It, the entire game is just arranged to make what they want what I want. Um, or, you know, more, Skinner is passe. He's, he's a tainted, um, uh, tainted title, tainted uh, name since his post-Chomsky days, you know, after he had the dispute with Noam Chomsky. Um, but nowadays we have people who are endorsing exactly the same stuff. So we have, you know, the nudge, the, the nudge uh, way of thinking uh, popularized by Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler, uh, who worked in, actually in the Obama administration. These are powerful people who are writing books that are highly influential, and they are coming from this perspective of behavioral economics, where they are basically saying, well, here are all these irrationalities and the way that men look at the world, and here's how we need to change them. Um, and I, I think it, it, given a superficial reading of some of the data, you might reach those conclusions. I'm a big fan of, you know, what's called ecological rationality. I, I recommend actually people a lot of the times, there's a book by Gerd Gigerins are very good on this uh, called Rationality for Mortals, has a chapter that focuses on this where, you know, there, there's this tendency for the social engineers to look at supposed human irrationality as being some kind of mistake. Like if their models don't match human behavior, it must be the human behavior that needs fixing. Um, ecological rationality takes the other, the, the other approach, basically saying, well, if there's something that humans have been doing for a long time and they have a reaction built into them that seems irrational, it's probably because your model hasn't looked at the full picture. And you actually see a lot of these irrationalities are to avoid uh, greater threats. Um, either way, this is an appealing ideology. This is, this is how this, you know, to kind of answer your question, I can't give you a specific time. I mean, that, that kind of, that can be your own personal uh, preference where that began, but it's such an appealing ideology for people because it justifies, I, I guess, a kind of arrogance where, when looking at other human affairs because it allows you to, to say what you want and uh, do this, have this really strong will to power uh, over other people. Um, and again, like other, other societies, other countries, you know, if you look at China and Russia, I mean, China in particular has, has a lot of kind of weird stuff going on, but in general, even they look at this, the, the Western style of social engineering as being kind of creepy. Um, the nice thing about China is that they're very open about what they're doing. They, they will just say, we have a social credit score and we, you know, we want you to avoid this and do this and stuff like that. Um, I, I think the twisted thing about the Western way of looking th at things is they genuinely want you to believe that this is what you want. It's, it's more about, it's more in your brain. It's, it's kind of freaky in a way. So. so you touched on the digital panopticon before. Um, you just touched on yeah. social credit scores. So moving into the future, I mean, my personal view of the future is, well, I think the trend's pretty clear. Um, I think we're moving towards less personal freedoms. I think we're moving towards increased technocracy. Um, so with that said, like CBDC, social credit scores, digital IDs, how do you think these are gonna fit into society and what threats do you think they have? Do you, if, if even at all, maybe you think they're a good thing? <laughs> um, I think people in crypto, especially like to talk about CBD, CBDCs uh, a lot. I think that the threat, I mean, here, here's my take on it. A lot of these threats are threats. They're only threats if you, 
voluntarily take them. You know what I mean? I think um, a lot of the dangers that exist in the world, you can actually very easily opt out of them, um, even when it comes to privacy violating technology and stuff like this. Um, I think the problem for governments that are going to do CBDC, the, I always have trouble with that acronyms, either way, digital, uh, central bank digital currencies, uh, the problem that they're going to run into very quickly is that they need backwards compatibility with all the previous ways of doing things. I mean, just to, I mean, the IRS in the United States, just as an example, they still communicate via fax machine. Like if you, if you have to send them something, you fax it to them or vice versa. Um, so that's, uh, so in order, to, it, it'd be hard to force something like this on people because there are a lot of, frankly, a lot of people in this country, it might be hard for us to realize that are not really on the internet or if they are, they just have a cell phone and there's a lot of things they can't do. Um, so uh, having a government run digital currency, uh, I think is not a big threat because I don't think there's a good way for them to force it on us right now. Um, now, China is doing some interesting stuff or has some interesting ideas. You may have heard this is a, a Keynesian dream. Uh, you know, they have something like they can give you credits that expire. So you have to send, uh, spend them on something. Um, so th there are some things that I think our government, I mean, to put it this way, that would be useful for them. But also they can just inflate the currency and therefore incentivize you to, to spend more. Right. It's, it's equivalent. It's kind of similar, uh, similar things. So when it comes to a lot of this stuff, I will just say I'm not super worried about it because most people are in a position where they can opt out. And um, whether you think you might think that this is just an inevitability, I frankly don't think it is. I am even resistant to using cell phones uh, and I encourage people to always not use cell phones for things because that's actually going to be the next thing. That's going to be all this digital ID, CBDC, all this kind of stuff. The real next thing they're going to enforce is cell phone usage for more and more mundane things for filling out your taxes. You have to have an app for this, that, and the other, because that actually is a great biometric uh, machine that is attached to you that you can tie to an identity and people are doing it voluntarily. That, that actually is the thing that people need to worry about. I think it's less worrisome talking about oh, what kind of currency scheme is the government going to come up with? Because frankly, I mean, they're probably, they're delusional. They're, it's probably going to fail. It's not going to work the way they expect. And again, they need backwards compatibility with all the people who don't know how to use, uh, they, they can't make it mandatory for income taxes because a lot of people aren't going to do income taxes. You know what I mean? That That's, I think, the issue. So I think you have more, I think you have less faith in them than I do. Um, like, what, why do you think people can opt out of them? Like, I personally think, you know, with this di digital ID, uh, for example, you just said people have phones that are tied to them. It's I, I see it as all going to be one, right? So even yeah. in Australia now, they're rolling out a digital ID program. It's very easy just to link, say, a CBDC to that. It's very easy to implement regulations that the shop down the street can't accept cash. They can't accept crypto. And as we saw, you know, with COVID, 90% of people will just like ice. They'll melt under pressure and then the yeah. world will take the path of the least resistance. So why, why do you think that they won't be able to implement a social, uh, sorry, a CBDC um, in that scenario? I mean, if they were to do something like that, it would have to be very gradual. I don't think that, um, I, I do think that people can be like the proverbial f frog in the boiling water. Um, I think that's the case. In fact, that's, that's where we are right now. The reason we are where we are now is because um, the temperature has been gradually going up and people aren't making a fuss about it. But I just say like within the immediate life, you know, within a couple of years, I, I just find that really, um, it, it's, I'm looking at it from their perspective and I just see it as if, man, this would just be a logistics nightmare to enforce this on people. Even if most people are complying, um, there are a lot of people who are going to fall through the cracks. It's not going to work. In the, like people are going to juke the system. They're going to be able to use other people's IDs for things. They're going to, there are ways of skirting around it that I think complicate it in ways that we might not even realize. Um, so, uh, and it becomes one of those things where, if you force draconian regulations on people too quickly, they will suddenly, even law abiding people will say, uh, you know what? I don't feel that bad just not doing this. Um, and that's often how it is. So if it does happen, I think it's going to be ha something that happens a little slower and a little in the future. And again, my stance is you got to, again, when it comes to cell phones, I think there's something that's right in front of us that people aren't paying enough attention to a lot of other things on the internet. 
uh, are as well. Um, that's something that I think people should be putting their foot on the brakes about. And it's much easier to, to do that than in other cases. So, you know, that's my statement there. And social credit scores, we're obviously seeing them, as you mentioned, play out in China at the moment. Do you have like a, I suppose, a thesis on when they'll be implemented, whether they'll be implemented at all? Well, in the United States and in Europe, um, again, China, when they do things, they do things in the open. Okay. They're very honest about the system they have. Functionally speaking, in the United States, we have a social credit score. It's not a literal number that you can look up. Um, but I think people are very much aware of the fact that things that they say and they do and they're, you know, it, it, this isn't just like political beliefs, but even other things like there is this, you, you are judged in a way by your employer uh, and uh, other systems. I mean, banks already have this kind of stuff, right? You, you might not know it or not, but every bank, um, you know, basically has a social credit score for you, like their own scoring of what kind of person you are. Um, and a lot of or other organizations have that as well. So I think that will happen in the United States and in Europe and other places in Australia. Uh, in fact, it's really already happening, but it's not going to be as honest as the Chinese system where they come out and say that this is what's going to happen. Um, I, I view that as just being very unlikely. Um, so I think it's going to be more kind of a soft totalitarianism, kind of a, a private, um, mostly enforced by corporations and, and uh, public hysterias and stuff like that. Yeah, I love your take on that. Um, do you think uh, even like a carbon credit score we've seen, I think it was Visa or MasterCard came out and started rating purchases now. Do you think that's more likely the scenario? Yeah, I think that's a good example of the boiling water slowly, you know, getting hotter under the frog where we're going to see, I mean, we, we already see stuff like this. I mean, this credit card companies uh, have for years, of course, done individual business relationships with small businesses to, you know, get deals and stuff like that. And it's not too difficult to imagine governments to come in and, and say things about carbon credits and things like that. And that actually is a fantastic example of kind of the, the Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler kind of social engineering where you don't even have laws being passed. You just have very soft power from the government and corporations that is slowly molding behaviors in such a way that they want. Um, and, and I think in the, the carbon credit seeing this is just all i mean I, I would love to get audit uh, audits of some of these organizations behind it but i'm sure they're entirely fraudulent this is like really a religious hysteria for a lot of the elites um and it has such an importance to them and very little importance to anyone else uh, um uh, but either way i think that 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 is how things are going to slowly happen they're just going to slowly integrate things into technologies you already use and you're used to and then when it's crazy, you're going to be like, ah, what am I going to do? Cancel my credit cards? That's hard. That's how it happens. So um, uh, how does crypto fit into all of this? So what's your thesis on crypto? Firstly, do you, I know you're uh, into Bitcoin, into Monero. Do you think DeFi plays a role in this too? Um, and I suppose, how does this, all of the crypto scene fit into everything we just spoke about? Well, it's a way of doing the things that the demonic Orwellian technology can do without an intermediary. Okay, that's the purpose. Um, now, I'm not a big fan of, fan I love fancy technology because it's so cool. Um, but when you do need to transact digitally, um, you have the choice now of using some evil corporation that is doing social engineering, or if they're not, they can easily be pressured to do that. Or you can use a permissionless system that you are the custodians of the funds of. Um, and so that's the choice. Like that is, a, that is the purpose of cryptocurrency. Um, it is actually, when it comes to other technology, um, cryptocurrency is like a unique problem because obviously currency has to be scarce and digital scarcity is something like really weird. Like you have to do all this weird proof of work, um, basically creating your own like game theoretic uh, gerbil wheel um, to make digital scarcity work. And Bitcoin, of course, is the original example of that. It's doing something that it, it should, I mean, obviously the technology is still very much in development and there's a lot of mess with it, um, but it's really the only weapon we have uh, against this kind of digital monetary surveillance state. 
Um, because no matter what, even if you're using cash or using old school banks, you're not using any, any of this fancy stuff, even like, even if you just have stuff in a credit union, to be able to transact online without free software is literally just impossible. Uh, unless you have Bitcoin, Monero, something like that. Um, now, as it comes to DeFi, um, a lot of times people say DeFi and they mean Ethereum. Uh, but either way, uh, you know, DeFi, I think, is a good example. It, like, it's a theoretical thing right now. Uh, I don't think there's any really fancy financial instruments that we can speak of that are trustworthy in cryptocurrency right now. Uh, it is something that can happen in the future. Um, as especially as privacy is added added to these you know core technologies, I think that that's something that we can see right now. It's just stabs in the dark. It's people doing uh, it often, sometimes very worrisome things uh, because, of course, blockchains in general, unless they have specific zero knowledge technology or, or ring signatures or something like that, they are they're public information, and actually, they can be an even worse alternative. Um, than a, a centralized system in some cases. But if we do things right in cryptocurrency, that is, the, the role of it is serving as an opt-out system for this domain that otherwise would be totally monopol monopolized by central banks and, and uh, you know, PayPal and things like this. So I don't know how to frame the question that I'm thinking of in my head, but I think the crux of the question is Bitcoin or Monero and why, or both. Uh, well, I got a lot to say about both. <laughs> um, right now, if you want to transact value, you, you just have to use Monero. Um, you can kind of get away with Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin was totally unusable a couple months ago when lots of people were using the network and you'd have to pay like $5 to send $2 to someone else. You know what I mean? Um, right now, transaction fees are in Bitcoin are pretty low, so it's not a big problem. They've always been low in Monero, uh, so it's not an issue. And more importantly, of course, with Monero, you don't have to worry about your, you know, privacy footprint because there basic there basically is none. Um, so I think it'd be irresponsible to say uh, to tell anyone to use anything other than Monero right now. Um, that said, Bitcoin. I I don't, you know, I'm not against Bitcoin. I think that technologies can be built on top of it to make it better, and that's kind of the strategy that Bitcoin maximalists will take. The fact is, right now, it's just not a very usable thing. Um, for a, I mean, really the people who are using Bitcoin are people who just want to use Bitcoin and it's not very useful in itself. And it comes with so many issues uh, specifically in privacy and again, network uh, usage and stuff like that that make it very hard to use. So, um, but again, I'm, I'm not against it. I'm not against it per se. Um, and in fact, a lot of times when people get into crypto, I mean, my recommended portfolio for a lot of people, this is not financial advice, by the way, um, but usually my recommended portfolio is something like uh, start with 90% Bitcoin and 10% Monero. Um, now, that sounds weird when I'm saying something that Monero is indisputably better, and I think it is. Uh, but the reality is Bitcoin just has like a lot of momentum behind it because it's big and people know about it. And Monero, um, I think, is still uh, it might be the better choice, but like it's one of those things where a technological standard doesn't just naturally win just because it's the better choice. Uh, so that's what I would say. Luke, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, yeah no problem.